Yeah, a lot of the um, the Latin names are just the Latin name for common plants in Europe, and so they're you know, sort of associated like all of now. But you know, one of the things that I talk about when I talk to lecture about naming is that there's a one-to-one -one association in Europe between plant names and the names that were in common use over historical time from Latin. But when European countries colonized the rest of the world, and for example, the New World, all the plants had names, but we don't know most of them now because the cultures were wiped out either through war or disease. And you know, the Northwest is one of the few places where the culture survived relatively intact. And we know a lot of plant names here that were indigenous names. But the interesting next step is China, where the culture remained intact. And they all have a taxonomy for plants in China that is in Chinese. And overlaying on that now is a international, you know, sort of Latin scientific nomenclature too. Uh, I had a Chinese graduate student who said when he first studied botany, he took a class called Plant Taxonomy, and all they learned was Chinese names. And he took another class called Plant Evolution, and they learned Latin names. <laughs> so it's that's a very different. It's the only place where there's really two completely intact nomenclature systems. Okay, seven o'clock. Um, call the meeting to order. Um, I said I would uh, have a short reflection. So let me. Um, the, when the, I was hinting at the, it being having to do with Holly. Um, there's a really good for. Did I send this around to you guys? The article, the link to this article in the High Country News about Holly. It's really well done. Um, but they highlight some research that was done by a scientist at UW Buffalo named David Stokes. And I want to read just a little bit of their uh, sort of a layman's interpretation of his work, and then a few lines from the abstract of his publication. So, it says, in 2011, Stokes decided to determine the true rate of Holly's spread. He chose St. Edward State Park as a site for field research. The field work took two seasons. Uh, they gathered, he and his assistants counted tree rings to discern the age of individual plants and discovered that the data covered almost a half a century. The first holly to invade Stokes study area sprouted in 1966 during the residential construction boom just north of the park where ornamental holly still grows today. The invasion started slowly and then exploded, a common pattern for invasive species. After 1990, the holly population in their study area doubled about every six years. So that's doubling every six years since 1990. Stokes and his students also observed a significant reduction of native vegetation under holly canopies. In the biggest holly clump, they found roughly 645 square feet. They found no native plants. Stokes published these results in the journal Northwest Science in 2014. And this is the abstract from the abstract. Trees more than 10 years old appear to have very low mortality rates and exhibit an accelerating rates of size increase and biomass accumulation with age. Native vegetation was greatly reduced under holly canopy. Our spatial and age data indicate that holly is proliferating and spreading rapidly at two scales, contiguous primarily vegetative expansion of tree clumps and long distance dispersal via seed. Spread by both mechanisms appears to be accelerated with the population and canopy area both increasing approximately exponentially, having doubling times of approximately six and five years respectively. Projecting past spread patterns forward suggests that holly has potential to soon become a prominent species, both in number and canopy extent, likely at the expense of native plant diversity and forest structure. Based on these results, we offer recommendations for holly management and forested areas in the region. So I bring this up because I think that, uh, as I was mentioning a moment ago, I think uh, renewed interest uh, in invasive species would be something I think that the tree board could uh 
take on that would, I think, help our tree canopy and our tree native forest, community forest. Uh, it's something we should probably continue to have as a part of our uh, program. Okay. Um, introductions. Let's go around since we have a couple of new people. Um, I'll start. Um, I'm Dick Olmstead. Do we have, uh, there's a hand up that a visitor or somebody? Yeah, so this so so we ask visitors to wait until the um, citizen comments, which will come up pretty quickly. Yeah, you got that, Gary? Okay. Um, Do we have any board members over there out there? No. Uh, Sandy said she wasn't going to be able to make it, so I think we're all here that are able to be. Here. Marty. Marty. No. So. I'll make that announcement, I guess, right now. Marty uh, Byrne uh, told me yesterday that she is resigning from the tree board. I asked her if she could be here tonight to sort of be acknowledged for her contribution. She said, I think I'll make it a clean break. So she's not going to be here tonight. So we're back to six. Uh, <laughs> so by way of introduction, I'm Dick Olmstead, I'm chair of the tree board, retired professor at UW. And let's go to our new tree board members, and you can give us a little more introduction than I just gave to myself. So, so let me get started. Uh, my name is Victoria Kutas. I've been in Lake Forest Park for eight years, um, and have spent most of that time just kind of getting settled in, establishing our home, our careers, etc. And I'm really excited to get back to community engagement. My background is in nonprofit management. Um, and started in community outreach and volunteer engagement. So really excited to do some of the pieces about around community engagement, community outreach and education. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what brought me here. What attracted you to the tree board? Um, what was that? Our desperate need. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it was what opportunities are available. Um, we also last year had to unfortunately take out a legacy tree on our property um, that gave me a bit more insight. I've always heard, you know, every time election cycles come up or there's community conversation, the importance of our tree canopy always comes up, um, but hadn't looked into any of like what our policies look like around it. What does it take to, to actually um, look at it? removing trees or replacing trees or things like that. So got a tiny taste of it last spring and I'm excited to learn more. The red tape helps keep our forest <laughs> canopy intact. It does. We, could, we could shred the red tape and use the fertilizer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stacey Spain. I've been um, in Lake Forest Park since 2018, November 2018. Um, I have a background, I'm actually a lawyer, non-practicing lawyer but uh, work for a large company in the Office of the General Counsel doing more strategy and operations work. So that's my background. Um, I, I'm very interested in the outreach similar to Victoria and Victoria, right? <laughs> um, similar to Victoria, uh, definitely getting the word out um, about invasive species, things that we do to protect our tree canopy, which is so unique. When I first uh, looked to move to Seattle, I was in Southern California. And one of the things you can see from sort of these satellite images when you go to look for homes on real estate websites is the tree canopy in the forest park. So that's a huge reason I moved here. Um, and why the tree board? Besides Dick sharing the details on the opportunity, <laughs> um, I had to remove a ton of uh, ivy from our own property more than I thought. Initially, I thought it was just really pretty and then realized how terrible it was. And we removed something like 6,000 tons of it. Um, it was growing all, yeah. 6,000 pounds. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, exactly. It's been a lot of ivy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's been a lot of ivy. Oh, a lot of ivy. Oh, we made it. A lot of pickups. <laughs> Yeah. Six thousand pounds um, was growing all up the side of our driveway in our backyard. So that was a huge learning experience, and um, just super interested in, in working with the, the tree species. Okay, 
Do we continue this way? Matt? Uh, Matt playing on the city clerk. Please. Everybody knows that, but I think everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> that means the Elizabeth Silvera sympathizer of the city with clerk's clerk. And the person who will be main liaison yeah. city staff to the, to the three board. Well, this yeah. was then our last three board meeting, right? Yeah. That was your first, so you're pretty new here. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Larry Goldman. I'm on the city council. I'm the city council liaison of the tree board. And I apologize for not being able to be at the meeting to vote for you. I was giving a final exam, so I didn't arrive until about eight o'clock or so. What do you do in your day job? I teach chemistry at U. He does. Oh, good. Okay. I didn't know. Great. I'm Doug Sprugel. I'm a retired forest ecologist, also with UW. And I'm not religious about this thing, but my mother-in-law is staying with us, and she came down with COVID two days ago, and I just tested this, morning, this afternoon, but better safe. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks for the Yeah, I am Mark Phillips. Uh, I'm relatively new to the free board, too. I, I, I won't be able to say that much longer, because it's been about a full year now, I guess, that I've been done with the free board. Uh, my background was uh, my, my professional background was in uh, uh, training development, instructional design, and training development in, in various uh, business settings. Um, and I've been interested in trees for for a long time, and worked on several projects with the city on related to uh, uh, tree code and uh, the community forest management plan development. Things like that. So, Mark was Larry's predecessor as our uh, council liaison because he was on the council until a year ago or so, two years ago. Two years. Uh, John Brew, I'm with the LFP Stewardship Foundation, and uh, I think my main interest is learning how to do restoration work in our parks and around our city in general. So, got to do a fair amount of that. And John was a volunteer in the project that Julia led on doing the restoration along Mackler Creek. Okay. Um, thank you all. And uh, next item on agenda is adoption of the agenda. So you all have the agenda that uh, Matt sent around. He sent a revised one around after I asked him to put the work plan, 2024 work plan on the list. Does anybody have any? Other changes or additions to make sure. If not, is there a motion to adopt the approve the agenda? Yes, I move adopted. Okay. Second. You guys start. You're gonna figure out okay. all in favor of uh, approving the agenda. Thank you. Um next is the minutes. So the minutes for our special board meeting on uh, December or November 29th. Uh, we're signing along with the packet. Um, anybody have any uh, additions or corrections to the minutes? I have one sort of minor correction, but in, on the item about the board uh, on the comments about the, the tree inventory, it says the board agreed to send their proposed changes to Mr. McLean for further discussion at a future meeting. Yep. Um, oh no, that was for the web, the social media. That wasn't yeah, for the. Right. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the stuff that we were going to send to the watershed people. Oh no, no that was <laughs> right. That was uh, a bill and the. Yeah. All right, so okay. that's fine. That's way over my picture. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did but, have one question though. Uh, it the. Uh, it was announced last time that there were three applicants for the tree board. Yep. Did one withdraw or not? Uh, no, she just wasn't available to be in her. Okay. Uh, so we may yet have to be able to return to full screen. Yeah. Okay. Good. Nick, but your, uh, your comment about the uh, um, the changes to the social media and stuff, maybe we should revisit that because our new Members might yes. like to hear about something. Can we add that to the agenda belatedly? Um, sure. Let's put that on uh, old business and we can. Uh, 
as to the other old business. Outreach planning. Okay. Okay, so uh, we have a motion to approve the minutes. Doug, second? Second. Mark, thank you. All in favor of approving the minutes? Okay. Um, okay, now it's time for citizen comments. We ask that uh, anybody who would like to make a comment to do so now and please restrict your comments to three minutes. Um, do we still have people yeah. from Zoom? It says uh, three participants there. One of those is probably you as the... It's Elizabeth and I in the city. So, no, oh, so, so the person who was up... Oh, so it's three participants. Yeah, third. The person that was on there disappeared. Okay. Uh, not exactly. Yeah. I'm sure it was a real person. Oh, okay, right. Okay. Yes. Um, so related to public comment, the city council recently adopted a change, uh, basically saying that in addition to the three minute requirement, the comments need to be germane. Um, um, so, need, so comments, we need to be germane to some something that the tree board is responsible for or, or something along those lines. Yeah, that's good. That's never been a problem, but I understand it has been a problem. There, there was a, a notable city council meeting, yes. <laughs> and that's been true, I guess, in public meetings. All over the country in the last few weeks. John, did you have a comment? I have no comment. All right, thank you. Um, communication, this is an agenda item that always seems a little uncertain as to what falls here. But Matt, is this an opportunity for the you to tell us anything that we need to know from the city or um, Elizabeth? I really don't have a knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Any any um, news on the arborist search? Uh, that won't be completed or started until after the community development director starts, and he starts. Um, Mark Hoffman starts on Monday. Okay. okay. Somebody. Yeah. Okay. So for those who don't know, we haven't had an arborist. For how long now? Three months or then longer? Six months. Six, 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 six months. Yeah. Close to six. Yeah. Okay. Do we usually just have one? Yes. Okay. And it's a part time position, okay. which may be part of the reason why it's hard to keep it still, right? Because it is a lot of work. And uh, what's the response? Uh, a large part of it is uh, reviewing permits and uh, making site visits and making decisions or recommendations to the city for legal action, things like that. It's just, it's just quite a lot of work. Yeah, like for any permit that's of any substance, that the simple permits, you either take a tree out and replace it. Basically, Elizabeth, as far as I know, Elizabeth signs off on it, her predecessor did. But if it involves more than one tree or big trees or anything like that, then the arborist gets involved and has to recommend what's the appropriate replacement and so forth. And apparently it's uh apparently it's not very rewarding, I guess you'd say well, a lot I, of people don't like it. One of our recent last couple of arborists, I can't wait it's the last one we before that. This felt like the difficulties we had dealing with a couple of things. People who were unhappy about permitting things like that. Yeah. Let him to go back to five cents. <laughs> okay. Um all right, then let's take up old business. Uh, the tree analysis report. Um, I don't know if the final draft got sent around to everybody, did it? Did I hope not, because I didn't see it. No, there. I think it was just sent to Doug and me. And no, so uh, maybe I should have asked that it be sent to everybody before this point, but <laughs> sorry. I haven't seen it. So no. Oh, Phil, <laughs> that's right, Phil sent it. Um, and he asked that one or more of us be able to come to a future council meeting, at which point there can be will be some discussion. Of it. And so, um, Doug has agreed to serve in that role, and I said I would attend also. So there will be two of us there. Um, I did take a chance to look over it, especially with respect to some of the. Uh, 
concerns I had raised when we had in our last meeting. It was all about going over this document, the first draft of it, and uh, and the people from the the BCG water setting were here, and they were really good. They presented it. They answered questions. They took notes about our concerns, and I felt like they did a good job with uh, respect to our comments. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. About? Oh, I agree. I, I, I looked over, I mostly looked over things. I really wish they had changed. They, they, there's this graph in there. Oh, by the way, for those of you who've only seen the previous draft, they're really very close to identical. Yeah. They're, just, they're, they're very, very minor changes. Uh, but we have an air, a graph that says how much air pollution takes out, the trees take out, and it shows this big spike in November. But it turns out it's only based on one particular year. It's not it's not an average over many years. It's the year 2020, 2020, 2022. Some year we had a lot of fires in November. Um, so it's not really very representative. I wish they had just taken it out. But other than that, I think they did a good job. But the report overall and the changes. They did a couple of things that I asked for, like putting in a, an appendix with a list of all the species that were identified in any of the plots and what their percent uh, cover were. Um, they included a line in the text of the document as to how many species were identified. 72, I think, was what they came up with. Um, with a note that there were many more, of course, that are found you know, in, in low frequency that were not sampled in the plots. Um, what else did I see? That... Well, they had a section on uh, pathogens and climate. Yeah. Climate change and the increased uh, prevalence of subsurface yeah. pathogens in certain trees. And that all was stayed the same. I'm just thinking about what. Well, I was thinking that I had asked, and I think others were interested too, in leaving what guidance they might include. Oh, that. Because yeah. they, they said that your strategy should be diversity. Yeah. And we're seeing, like in that article that, that you all circulated, uh, about there are active, active uh, activities going on now where people are. Are putting so in the migration sequoias were particularly mentioned. And, I, uh, I, I, I imagine other trees yeah. coming to that camp. <laughs> whatever, whatever thrives yeah. in Oregon, I guess. Yeah, I thought that that was a well, come, we can come to that. that anyway, way. I just wondered if there was any, any movement. They did, point. they um enhanced, they expanded the section on invasive plant species, which was one of the other concerns that we raised. Um, and they and I alerted them to that article by uh, David Stokes, and they cited that in there. Um, and they also included a graph, uh, a bar chart of percent cover by the small lot, large lot, and town center areas, which is one of the things we asked them to do since that. And they compared it to what the city's targets are, which were excellent, because in both the small lots and large lots, the Canopy cover is exceeds the city's targets by a small amount. So it's, you know, there's a wide amount of error given the standpoint. But nonetheless, we're uh, doing well with respect to the city's goals for canopy cover. Well, I don't know if you had more things you look like. Uh, not really. I was going to come back to the comment about that article about the assisted migration. Well, I was just wondering if it would be helpful for us to take five minutes or seven minutes not get too deep into it but to talk about what you what you guys want to say or what you're expected what, what do you think the council is expecting you to to say with you is it just here's what it is we've looked at it we had these questions and we think some of them have been addressed and uh, we're happy to work on this in the future or do you think they're expecting recommendations i don't know sense? Doug, what is your sense of that what i had in mind doing talk about this especially and i probably talk about it um First of all, I was going to explain that we have to, how the study was done very, very briefly. It's basically, it's kind of people going on the ground and measuring trees, as opposed to the other kind of study we do, which is done with airplanes. So we have the canopy study done from airplanes and the tree inventory done on the ground. And just because that's likely to be confusing, particularly the brand new council members, probably the old ones too, not new, but some <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to do that briefly and then just sort of reading. Be honest, read off the front page, the front page of the uh, review of their executive summary and say just tell them, you know, what we have in the city. Now, um, it will provide us the raw data. We've worked on this before for making recommendations later on about where to set our cutoff for exceptional trees. 
And I actually have a comment about that later. But yeah, I, I, I haven't looked at the raw data. But I haven't looked at the raw data. I have, those. I have a little bit. I'm going to have a brief comment on that. Um, anyway, that was the main thing I was going to do, and then I was just going to throw over for questions. So I figured maybe yeah. 10 minutes at the outside. Because there is there is an item on the work plan that we're going to be looking at in a few minutes, I think, that has to do with developing box or ideas coming out of that free input yeah. order. I think specifically it's referring to the free input yeah. order. First, let me say, Victoria, we, a couple of years ago, went through the city's tree ordinance and made some recommendations for changes. Um, and the council adopted most of those recommendations, but the one that they tabled was one in which we recommended the, the size of trees for greatest protection uh, to be dropped a little bit so it would provide greater protection for a greater number of trees. Um, and to make it a little more uh, consistent across species, because the, the old document had sort of a different diameter for each different species, not those for most of and so on. Um, and the council picked up on a good point, which was, gee, we don't know what proportion of trees in the city fall into those, that, those size ranges. But the inventory will give us data that will actually say, you know, if we take the minimum tree size down from you know, 42 inches to 36 inches or to 32 inches or something, how much, how, how many more trees will that affect? And so that's one of the elements in the, the raw data of the study that will give us some. And uh, John and Larry and I did some preliminary calculations based on the data from 19, you know, 19, 2010. And, but I think we went just a little, I, my opinion, we went a little ways on that. So, you know, this is really silly. We've got people out in the field right now getting new data. Why should we use 11 year old data? So we, we took a table that. Um, so that's something that we're we'll using. So, so it sounds like it's more of introducing this as we come to know it and we might have to. Right. I don't think this would be the first time that the council would say that, is it? Do you want me to give the council my council perspective? Sure. Uh, I started to make it back. I was just going to say that maybe in terms of recommendations, it's yeah, I, that that's something that we might work on during the course of the year. It might be good to say that it, there may well be recommendations coming out of that inventory that was done. And we intend to pursue some of those as we get into our work plan. So, yeah. so Larry, did the council adopt this plan in the meeting after we gave our feedback? Was edited and so on, or is that yet to be adopted? You mean the inventory report? Yeah. Um, that hasn't been it hasn't been introduced yet. Okay. Okay. So is that something that will That's follow uh, say Doug's presentation or uh, Doug's uh, appearance with the council? Oh. So I, I have a, a few things to say. I'll okay. just brief. Um, in terms of adoption, that strikes me as more of a formality. Because we're not taking it, like we're not amending any code or anything like that. We're just basically hearing a report from you right. about it. So the more formal action would be if we're changing code. So I think what the city would, so there's of the eight of us, seven council plus the mayor. I'm fair, I'm quite familiar. Two council members are brand new, so they are coming in from the ground. And then the other five have the familiarity from one to two years ago, which honestly is probably going to be somewhat rusty. So I would say I agree with most of what you said. Uh, start out with kind of a high level. What did the inventory do? I think something you might want to address would be how much or from the report, really not much at all, can we get comparing the two studies? I think that was something from ECQ Watershed is the, the data is blurry enough that we can't make any definitive conclusions about like specific trees, like how have big leaf maples changed from 2010 to 2023? And so making that clear to council, what can what conclusions can we draw? What can't we draw? And then also making it clear that this is kind of part one. Part two is gonna be the big data, you know, the big dive into the data and making specific recommendations. But some council members might wonder, well, how come you're not proposing code changes to get it? And just explain that this is the top level report and that the tree board will be discussing do we want to you know but not do you want to recommend changing diameters i want to make it clear i'm not telling i'm not trying to put my fingers on the scale in any way so i would say that's how i would approach it 
Uh, also, I wanted to address uh, Stacey and Victoria, since you weren't here last month for the discussion. Um, which day are you coming to the council? I don't know yet. I, I still last when we could come, and I said either the last council meeting, second council meeting in January, the second council meeting in February, and not going to be here the first council Okay. Um, uh, and I know that's the aim of course, you've been on vacation since I did that. So what I wanted to ask Victoria and Stacy in particular, um, do you feel comfortable with what the report looks like, or would you prefer time for the two of you to kind of look over the report um, before the report haven't even seen it? Yeah, right. I haven't seen the report, yes. but I did watch the YouTube video of the board meeting oh. where they presented. Okay, good. Well, that's great. <laughs> so, so I have some concept of what you're talking. For a little about. background. Yeah. Um, the city mandates that every 10 years on the I don't think so. I think the city only mandates the, the canopy, uh, the canopy uh, coverage. I could, I, could, I could be wrong about that. I, I know it mandates the canopy coverage. Yeah, I thought that inventory was mandated also. But anyway, about, well, it might, it in might. 2010, an inventory that was done. And so the plan was to do another one 10 years later. Mm -hmm. That got pushed back a little bit because of the pandemic and all the things. And so it was just completed this last year. And uh, the first one was done mostly by volunteer labor and a hundred plots were selected around the city. Um, some on large lots, some on small lots because there are different management regulations for trees on large and small lots. And there's some in the town center area, which is sort of the only commercial district. Were they all public lots? No, okay. no. So they did a hundred plots 10 years ago, now 13 years ago. And then when they went to redo this, the goal was to go back to those same hundred plots. But it turned out that a number of landowners, property owners, did not want uh, anyone coming out to their property to be sampled. Either the property changed hands or the owners had to, you know, change the part about that. So a number of new plots were established to get the number up to approximately the same. So even though many of the same techniques were used in measuring and taking data and the same uh, software program for doing analyses was used, uh, there's a lot of variance in the data from this inventory versus the one in 2010. So one of the results of that is that there's a, a random error around it. Any statistical measures is great. So uh, the comparison is an easy thing. Okay. Although the numbers look good. I mean, it, it, in those cases where the things like canopy cover, leaf area index, and some other things showed a trend towards more canopy and more cover, uh, but not beyond what would be considered statistically significant. So you can't really say it. And, and I just, just about two hours ago, I learned something that changed that a little bit. In the report in 2010, whatever it was, they used a city area of a city area of I think 1,978 acres. In the 2022 thing, they used a city area of 2,301 acres. So almost 500, no, 300 more acres. The city hadn't gotten any bigger in the last time I got I just learned this. I was working on the draw data this afternoon, and I said, boy, that's interesting. So the relevance of this partly is they calculated, we were saying they didn't, it wasn't necessarily good to compare the two things. They calculated 299,000 trees in the whole, in the whole city. Previous one calculated 249,000 trees, which, you know, we we're saying looks like a good, but with the same, with the error, you can't even really say that's good. Yeah, yeah. But it turns out to be good on the trees per acre. We're now at 130, and it was 125 before. So, so it's a, a very small thing. So even the even the things that look like they changed a lot didn't. Now the things like percentage of Douglas fir and you know size of the trees that's that's quite a bit different. I mean that they found that the trees were bigger. I think that would turn out to be true. I mean I don't think we'll have a way to set it statistically. They, but that big that big difference jump in the number of trees is because the big jump in the in the area. And I, I have absolutely no idea why. The when I looked up in Wikipedia that source of all knowledge, it gave the city areas about 2,300, about the area that we're using now, give or take 50 acres. 
Um, so the 1978 is is smaller than I can immediately come up with. I wonder if the acreage that falls in Lake Washington was it's not supposed to supposed to be not. This is supposed to be land area. One case. Yeah, it's supposed well, to be land area. Well, because I think I bet that acreage figure for the city includes land that's actually underwater. The city boundary actually extends into the lake. Did they happen to calculate how much of the land has been developed since then? Like, or, or were they look in ten years ago? Were there yeah. fewer buildings? I don't think they they did anything with respect to buildings. They were just doing the inventory trees. Okay. So you know, some of the inventory lots spots landed out here in the parking lot. Yeah. This is really the wrong kind of study yeah. for what you're just asking about. It. Yeah, that would be interesting because if it's if you're looking at trees per acre, sure. the you could sort of draw a positive connection if there are also more more developed areas within the same. Well, of course, that's part of what the tree code is trying to do is to maintain a canopy in the face of growth. Okay. So there are still requirements for maintaining a certain minimum canopy coverage on lots of different sizes. Yeah. And so even if a new house is built, the expectation is we don't need that on canopy coverage. And replacements are required. And so and there is a, a different kind of study we do based on air photos. Basically, they're lidars actually, but it's done to the air, which is this thing here did, I think, a total of 10 acres out of a city of 2,000 acres. The lidar study looks at every square meter. And it's, I believe, very, very comparable from one year to the next. And so we do have two consecutive years of that 2016 and, you know, I don't remember the year, 2010 and 2016, I think, which I think are very strictly comparable. And they do show the canopy area increase developments at all. The canopy area increased over that. I, don't know, I, don't, I can't remember the numbers, but five, five or ten years span. Um, so this is much more precise. It only tells you where there's forest and where there isn't. It doesn't tell you what kind of forest will be the tree or anything like that. But it's a really good measure of just how much forest there is and there's more forest. Well, I don't know if Stacy and Victoria have a comment on that before, but 71. Yeah. Uh, their thing to do would be to get yeah, it. I'm happy yeah, to send, actually, keep sending it right <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I didn't think about it. I mean, I think Phil sent it to us sort of as a to take a look at it. I was trying to, from, yeah, we might as well we get the, the, the uh, editor. <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, this was this was called final report, so yeah. Yeah, uh, well, there's no reason we all going to be any matching. Oh, yeah, 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 it should go to everybody. But I have another question about that meeting then, if I think somebody knows the answer. I mean, oftentimes the council will like to hear from the People who did the report. Um, yeah, I wonder if, if uh, Watershed will be at, at that meeting. Will, will they possibly be making the report at the same time? Which may influence what uh, then, uh, Richard had to say. <laughs> well, no, we can certainly plan to do it. Absolutely. But I just wonder if, if uh, that's kind of the plan or any story to see the agenda at this point. I don't know. One other difference was I mentioned that the previous one was done by the auditor, so this time the city hired a consultant firm to come in and do it. I was going to ask you to do it. In regards to your earlier question about like, are we do we want to feel like we need to review it? For me, since like you said, it's a report, not something that we are like signing on to recommendations on. I'm like, looking forward to reading it. But um, it sounds like the conversations about what do we do with it are still to come. So. I, th I think it'll be good for you guys to read it when you see it. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> the other thing that'd be good for you guys to read is the city street code. You know, which <laughs> it's a little tedious, but <laughs> we, uh, Doug and I, at least, we may be the only two left who were on the tree board when we went through the changes. And that was even I was up before you. I was up just on it. Yeah, there's. So we had a period where we went. The year we went over that tree code you know, line by line and you know making recommendations to changes. There were some of the recommendations for changes were made came from the arborist who had been on the staff for a few years and had some really good ideas about changes. And others were more from the tree board from the perspective of how is this uh, how does this read from a citizen point of view. And the, the next step that we hope to do, and which sounds like both of you guys might be interested in involved with, is how do we now communicate better to the public what the tree ordinance is all about, what the 
it, the reason for it is why as homeowners people should embrace this and not fight it. And that's you know something that we want to move forward. To. That's the next item. That's on next item. <laughs> Anything else about the the tree report? Well, just just very quickly. Um, I just I just looked at it this afternoon. Not, not the report, the report there, but the raw data. And I'm having a little difficulty getting exactly the same numbers as they put in, in their report. So I think it's just a matter of one of us is using different numbers or something. But I've written to them and asked them if they can figure out what I'm doing wrong, but basically. So there may be a little bit of a delay before we actually do anything, but it's, it's, it's not a huge difference. I come up with 288,000 trees in the city and they come up with 299,000. Oh. Doug's a force technologist. Yeah. <laughs> no. so, I mean, and I, he's really uh, understands this whole this approach, both the methods and the data better than uh, the rest of us. But, yeah, I think quite possibly related to the fact that the city has somehow grew 300 acres. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that may be my thing in the same But anyway, I'm working on that. Okay. Um, so, we have a Actually, how are we going to find out about whether? Watershed DGC is something. Uh, we can check on that in the future whenever we, whenever you are available and we make something happen. Now, have you already said to Phil when you would be available? I think you did. You? I told him I would be able to either the, the fourth Thursday, Thursday, right? Whatever you have to say. Tuesday? Thursday. 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 I would be available either the fourth Thursday this month or the fourth Thursday in February or anytime after that. Okay. Um, I mean, if the city wants to invite watershed DGC, that's great. I think that'd take do a better job than we could. Yeah, I think that would be good to have that there. Yeah, frankly. So, you mean we'd have to do very little. I think we could just, we might want to still introduce the fact that there are the two different kinds of studies. Yeah. And watershed DGC could summarize what they found. Yeah, and you can mention the process that we've gone through in terms of discussing for Yeah. Anyway. Let us know how that works out. We'll yeah. respond to program. Very quickly. All right. Anything else on the chairman's words? Okay. Um, I added outreach uh, to this outreach planning. Um, a little, uh, I uh, highlighted this just a moment ago that we're looking forward to doing be a better job of doing more active job of outreach to the community. Specifically around the value of the forest canopy, but also the tree ordinance and what it means and why uh, we have it and what you know, how, how homeowners can be uh, property owners and work with the city on this. And uh, Marty Byrne, who was one of our tree board members who was just sat down. Uh, uh, has been active on this, and Sandy Lavar, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, has been uh, engaged in this. And uh, Mandy was too. Yeah, and Mandy, who was another board member who uh, died tragically, cancer. So it was very quick uh, in the last year. So that's why we were part, why we were so uh, short of board work. Uh, so, you know, our Outreach part of the board has really taken a hit, which is why I'm really pleased that you guys have been interested in that. Uh, so, uh, but Sandy and Marty had put together some uh, mock ups of uh, material that could be distributed in various ways and presented that at the last regular board meeting. And uh, but the rest of the board hadn't really had a chance to grapple with it much. And so the plan was to have a meeting uh, of anyone on the board who, uh, some committee of the board to go over this and, you know, maybe in final edits or whatever. The city, Matt, I guess, or Elizabeth will be working with us to help implement these things, like make brochures. Um, Doug, you were going to. Yeah, I, was, I, I looked at it. I guess I finally decided it was easier to write to you and Mark and send you my comments rather than actually physically meet together. Yeah. The, but my reaction to my take on it was that there was a lot of there was a lot of really good stuff in it, mostly really good stuff. Um, 
it tended to sort of apply that the tree board was all about the tree code. And that's not really true. I mean, we're not really, we have helped sort of establish the outlines for, but the, the implementation of it is done by the arborist and assistant planner. And it, you know, we sort of grant, we sort of look over, but that's about it. And, and the reason this is kind of important is tree code is the thing that makes people mad about the city. Uh, people get upset when they try to put in a tree and it's expensive to replace it or something like that. And I don't think they want to get tired of that brush. So I, I kind of hope we could do something that doesn't, you know, that defends the tree code. Because part of our job is to explain to the city why we have a tree code. And, you know, that's what it's important for. But you know, we don't do the day to day enforcement or anything like that. And you know, most of it predates us. Um, anyway, I kind of wanted to get the tree board and the tree code separated a little bit in the materials. And, but the other problem was that it was it was really nice artwork, but we don't have the program that made the artwork. She sent us PDFs. So I don't, we can't really adapt it. So I think what I'll do is get your email address and send you what we got and put my, my comments on it. And then if either you have any comments on it, what I sent you. Do the same thing, you can sort of see where we stand. That's the best I can come up with. It's it's not bad, but it really I, I really didn't think it was it was quite ready to go to get printed on the you know, five hundred copies of a, of a brochure. Is it was it just a brochure they designed or was it other materials or what's the kind of scope of what they designed? Well, there was a brochure. There's a big deal that had to do with the website. Okay. Yeah, there's going to be some uh, edits to the website. Mm -hmm. right. I don't think that has gotten as far along. One of the plans that we hope to implement was to be to provide a either a, maybe a threefold brochure that could be mailed in a legal size envelope to all, say, new homeowners in the city. It's sort of a welcome to Lake Forest Park, you know. Here's your instruction to why we value this the canopy, uh, our tree forest community, and what your role as a property owner is within that respect. Um, so the, that was one of the tentative applications. But I think the way Mandy had developed this, there, it was okay. modular in a way that it, some could be put in something like that, something else could be used in a Poster that could be put up in those books or things could be or things could be put in the lake for part of the e news that kind of thing. The yeah, um, you guys both signed up for the lake for part e news. Yeah. It's a monthly e newsletter that goes out. Oh, they, they, I think they automatically get signed up. Oh, once you're yeah, I think once you're here, you can start. With I have a couple quick questions. Um, was there a discussion on sort of the 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 best way for that outreach to take place, and it was settled that it should be a brochure, or well, was there? No, I think the idea was that there would be multiple ways to do it. So oh. Mandy was really into using various social yeah. media. Yeah. Um, same. Which Sandy, sorry, right? <laughs> which Doug and I know a little about. So yeah. <laughs> that, that, you know, that's something where it's sort of a generational thing, perhaps. Um, so that was one aspect of it. You know, how can it be used in various uh, social media outreach yeah. as well? Were they as... working with an artist at all? I think Sandy was doing it herself. Oh, Sandy was doing the graphics herself. It, which, is why, which is why it's a little. Sandy is kind of trying to drop off the tree board too. I don't know why Marty left, but Sandy has been trying to drop off for several months now. I think her. Sandy had her work has, is there has her work being in Vancouver, that? Washington, Monday through Friday. So it's oh. only back in. Of course, park on weekends. Yeah. Right. So she right. can only attend <laughs> three board meetings by Zoom. Uh, and so and she, she has seen a lot of sort of all move right. this on move to other people if, if possible. Yeah. Um, but it was really nice we had to, if we could get her, so because we got this really nice artwork done, you know, nice brochure, it's all drawn up. It'd be nice if we had the technology of edit, 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 not to you know, get the technology or anything. Um, the Website is a little different story. Nick and I may not know anything about social media, but, but we, I think we all know about websites. There is a problem. I, 
The problem with the website is it's, it's organized by the function of the city. I mean, there's a planning commission section and a, a tree board section. So if it's not a section for trees, I mean, it has to either fall under a tree board or something else. And it's been on our really needs to be, there's, a, there's a section for parks, and I think we need a section for trees and forests that would have everything in it that's related to trees. But that's kind of hard to arrange. The item on the work plan that we'll get to is to review the city's web content with respect to trees. Um, that's been on our work plan for years, uh, in part because some of it was inconsistencies between what's presented in the, the website and what's in the ordinance and the revisions to the ordinance, and all of that needs to be brought into sync. And there's been too many moving parts that have resulted in putting this off until everything else settles down. Yeah. Uh, deal with the front end of the Is there something that makes you guys feel like the tree board is, has like a, a marking problem that, that they're an enforcer rather than an educator? No, I don't, and not no. for me. I think, I think of just this particular set of artwork or picture thing sort of really made it sound like our main thing was was enforcing the tree code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the tree board is our okay. no. And I don't think the public, for the most part, feels that. Okay. We did a really interesting thing, I think, two years ago now, maybe it was three, where we had a booth at the farmer's market one day. It was really nice. And the arborist yeah. came and spent the whole day. I was there the whole day. The yeah. arborist was there the whole day. And then some other three board members came and went. Yeah. And um, the arborist was accosted several times by sort of unhappy homeowners who felt like they had to do things that they didn't want to do with the trees. And she was very good about handling. Yeah. But it's the sort of thing that led to her replacement. Not being an arborist in the city for very long because he just couldn't handle it. Yeah, Those yeah. things happen. And then the next one, too. Yeah, I guess. I don't remember what she watched about. I don't think I know. In any event, um, we've had events like that. We do something with the, uh, the Spring Green Fair, which is held here in the town center where we have a table and you know interact with the public. So those sorts of things are usually really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing what's already been created. My questions are always around who are we trying to talk to, who's our audience, and what's our goal? So is it about making sure people know what the tree board does, or is it about making sure that people know more about the tree code, or is it both, or is it something else? So like figuring out like what is the actual message to get across, because um, I feel often it gets muddled, <laughs> and when you try to communicate everything in every method, it, it gets hard to consume. So I look forward to seeing what's been created. And um, I do a lot of that in my day job. <laughs> I think it's our big need to take the work that's been done with, with Sandy to the degree that she's still on the case uh, to uh, pull some threads through it like that and figure out what are the key, what are, what are the key vehicles, I think. For me, it's one of the key vehicles. And it's a, it's a finite number of things that we need materials for. Yeah. Even if you include some social media and the website and the brochure and daily and, and uh, maybe weekly or quarter or monthly or quarterly articles in the city's newsletter, it's kind of a finite number of things. And I find the, the work that Sandy's done is pretty pretty voluminous, and I have trouble with kind of figuring out what are the how to, how to make that those ideas and the language that she's crafted fit the specific needs that we have. Yeah. And the other point, I, I, from my point of view, I think the tree board, people need to know about the tree board if there is one, but really the, the emphasis, I think, is, is communicating information about trees and about how the city, uh, you know, works with trees and maintains yeah. trees. That, that's what I was I, gonna say too, it, it's really more, I mean, it's kind of a big deal that we have 50% forest cover. Seattle has 20%. Absolutely. We're, 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 we're incredible. It's kind of a big deal, and our forest cover grew by 5% over the period it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Seattle's tree cover over the same period dropped a tiny fraction of a percent, but it did drop. Yeah. You know, there were big articles in the paper, tree cover drops in Seattle. You know, we didn't get any papers, articles for a 5% increase. <laughs> 
And I appreciate the point you made earlier of figuring out how to do that without making the tree board synonymous with the tree code yeah. and figuring out how to talk about the holistic work that this group gets to do and educating homeowners, like you said, especially new folks to the area on um, the technicalities piece <laughs> and that they're they're related, but they're not the same and probably require different methods of communication and mechanisms for communication. We started a few years ago doing occasional um, pieces in the evening groups. And the idea was that they would be education. And so I did a few the very first year I did on three and then I sort of ran out of gas or something. But, that, <laughs> but other than yeah. that, so there was one nice one about, you know, uh, Christmas trees that oh. was done last year or the year before at Christmas time about, you know, what uh, whether to use living or or artificial trees and how to dispose of trees and things like that. And, um, so I, I think that that's the sort of, uh, you know, these would be no more than you know, 400 words in one photo or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but the one problem with that is that e -news doesn't go to very many people. It's a pretty small proportion of the city that is actually signed up for it. So trying to figure out a way to reach more people. There's a monthly newsletter, though, that goes out physically. There's a physical hard yeah. copy yeah. newsletter that goes out. That's more restricted, but there's still free space in it. Yeah. I, mean, I think they have, they're have they pretty hard nosed about not putting very long articles in there because, you know. Yeah. It's on the The city is means of communicating certain things to the public. Yeah. Is that monthly or quarterly? Monthly. It is most monthly. Okay, so anything else about outreach? I think that's this is something that should be an important element of the We're going to talk about here. it again in a few minutes, right? What's that? When we turn to the work plan. Yes. Now, the work plan is going to actually take up some time over the next couple of months. I meant to look up before we came today as to when this is expected to be at the city council. I know it isn't always at the city council by the time that our a guiding document says it's supposed to be, but at some time in February, I think, is when it's regarded. Yes, I'm going to align that change because it used to be scheduled in conjunction with the city budget process. Which is when? Which meant like August starting to have a work plan line, lining up so you could see budget implications that could be incorporated into the budget for the next year. Uh, but I, I think it makes more sense to kind of, or at least as much sense to do it. Early in the calendar year, and work on a calendar year basis. Um, I guess assuming that we usually don't have any large budget requests. Yeah. Um, the other thing that there's a couple of other things that come up this time of year. Um, one is that there has to be a uh, annual report that the board chair generally puts together that is submitted to the council and the city. Uh, and I'll be working on that uh, this month. And the other is the election of officers, which we are mandated to do by a certain date, I think, in February or something. So that's another thing that we're going to have to uh, do and take up in the next month. I bring that up now because I tried to get somebody else to stand for chair last year. This is my second year. Unsuccessfully, I agree to do it another year, but I'm not going to agree to do it another year. Yes. <laughs> you just say you would agree to do it. I, 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 I am not. <laughs> I am not capital and capital I'm going to do it another year. Okay. All right. Anything else about outreach for now? I think we should uh, move on. Okay. New business. Um, updated tree list. So this is something that has been a uh, on a on, on and off discussion for years also because the the tree code mandates that there is a tree list that replacement trees when permitting uh, tree removal permits are done uh, uh, must be chosen from this tree list. Um, I think I have a little bit of a reputation on this. Okay, start with that. Uh, so that's so that's a little bit of background. The part of the my concern about this, and we sort of got 
shut down about this by Bill in the city when we proposed that there not be a required list to draw from, but rather that it be a recommended list. Um, because, well, a suitable tree list would be would have hundreds, if not thousands, of species on it. And we have a tree list that has only, you know, quite a few actually. Yeah, it's a hundred and some, but it, it has many. It's, yeah, it's around two hundred, I think. I, yeah, that's right. It's uh, it's but lots. Of, there are two species of magnolia on it, for example. There's fifty species of magnolia that one could grow here in Seattle that would be wonderful trees. Um, so that's sort of my pet peeve. But what we also want to do is have a proscribed list of trees that people should not plant mm -hmm. as a replacement tree. And that's the document that I sent around. Yeah, I, I, this sort of starts there and then okay. Yeah, so let's go ahead. Then. This is just in case anybody's ever actually looked at the tree list. Sounds like if you replaced the tree, you looked at it. I have definitely looked at it, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever done it? No, I've never had to. Well, if you replace a tree, you can look at this list here that's this the trees you're supposed to consider replacing them. Um I find this really, really useful because it's got if you if you take a tree out, you say that say, all right, this is five hundred square feet of canopy area, you need to put in trees that will grow to five hundred square feet, and I think it's twenty-five years or something like that. It's a kind of an imaginary thirty years. But thirty, okay. But this tree here says, okay, I need to put in 500 square feet of canopy. I can put in one kusa dogwood and one flowering plum. And it, it, it really makes it easy. This is why, and, but it's not trivial to get these numbers. But I think it's, I find it really, really useful. I having done a few trees myself, I find it really useful to have this table. It also, you probably can't read it, but it has features on it. Um, so basically, I think, we, I, I think we really need to keep a list like this that has a lot of information. Yeah. Not, not just say you can put an entry you want to. No, I agree. So okay, that, does one of those columns get at the fact that you just mentioned about the, the, the canopy? Canopy area. Yeah. 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 The, uh, no, it doesn't get at the yeah. expectations, but the, the the second column. The, well, first off, the expectation in thirty years. Yeah. 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 Canopy area, height, and width of the crown are three columns that are those three small columns right in the center. Right. right. And those are, provide good guidance for. A homeowner who's trying to replace the tree that they're removing. Yeah. Um, my so my thought is okay. this makes a great recommended tree list. Yeah. Okay. Let's let me go on to the next one. Okay. Page two is the thing. Okay. So this is what I thought were possible changes to the list. The first thing we should do, and Dick is also it's exactly the same thing in this handout. We should really take off the tree list trees that King County considers <laughs> weeds of concern. No. Yeah. There are there are four of them on there: black locusts, European mountain ash, all the Asia platanoides, all the Norway maple, and horse chestnut. Uh, we really ought not to be recommending things that King County says are trees of concern. Yeah. Uh, so that that's the, the simplest thing. Um, the second thing I put on here was create a list of trees that may not be planted. Now we can't really prohibit anybody from planting trees. We can say they don't count for replacement. Right. Um, and you know, if we say you have to plant from this list, then that kind of implies these don't count. But I, I think it would be a really good idea to say, you know, no, really don't plant these trees. Yeah, not because they're not on the list. It's an the list. It's a bad list. Because I don't think many people know, for example, the Robinia pseudocacia or um, European mountain ash necessarily are considered to be problems for their uh, invasiveness. Right. And there are good yeah. alternatives. And Dick has provided an additional list here from more sources, many of the same trees, of course. Yeah. But uh, the other, the third step here, though, about four years ago, Kim Holland, who was the previous, not the previous, several, several previous chairs of the uh, Tree Board ago, who was, I think, he was like a landscape uh, horticulture professor at, at Shoreline or something. Edmonds. Edmonds. In, okay. He provided us with a list of 21 species he thought we should be taken off the tree list, and 69 species he thought we should add. Um, he had three major reasons for taking trees off. This is you know, the number three here, take, the working the list we have, taking trees off. Uh, a few of them were things that he said were invasive. They didn't happen to be in the noxious weed list, but they're known to be invasive, and they're affecting probably the same ones, many of the same ones you've got there, Fruitus avium, for example. 
um, a few of them, maybe six or eight, were quite pest susceptible and this kind of dealt with the thing we had in the report saying, you know, these are the emerald tree board, it's likely to become a problem. One of his recommendations would be not allow people to plant fractions. So this is short responsive to that. Um, and the third category, he said the trees that were too short. Um, he didn't want to put trees on there that were less than 20 feet. I would have to argue with that pretty strongly. I think there's a place for short trees. My front yard, for example, would hit out of the lake. I mean, by planting there, I want to plant something pretty short. So I, the, the three or four you said were too short, I wouldn't include. But I think we should take, look really hard at taking off the, the other ones that you recommended. Then those are the trees that are on that first page of Joe just uh, yeah. Well, the, the, that was page one of, of seven, but yes. Yeah, they are so they are trees on there that they're uh, on there. This recommendation would have would get all the recommended for the most right. And then the last thing he provided a list of 69 species that should be added. Uh it is a significant amount of work to add a new tree. To add, it's a significant amount of work to add 69 new trees. Did he not provide information on camp area or out hide or anything? No. So for 10 trees, we could uh, look up and find canopy areas and things like that. I'm not really excited about doing a 69 tree, just to say about the overnight trees. Um, but we can, we can add some trees. You know. I wonder if there are resources out there that could look up that information easily. You, know? you can find a, a fair number of them out in the uh, Agolis nursery. When they, if they have a tree in their stock, they will tell you about how big it is. Yeah. So that's, that's one source. And, you know, as I say, it's not too hard if you've got half a dozen trees or ten you want to add. It's not. It's not just the size, of course. You know, yeah. the width and things like that. Um, and the characteristics: is it a good wildlife tree? Is it salt tolerant? Is it water tolerant? Or drought tolerant? Things like that. It takes time to add a new tree. Um, just because you need that information, right? Yeah. It's it's, good. Uh, if you want to have all the information that is in this list, yeah. or anything you add, right. that's what would take time. To got it. And do you have to source it from specific area? Because mm -hmm. I'd be happy to volunteer. I mean, it, it, I don't think it needs to be sourced from particular areas. This needs to be a reliable source. Okay, right? you know? got it. But, I don't really think we need to add all those trees. I'd be really happy to say, you know, if you find something else you want to put in, um, just you know, tell the uh, tell the arborist I want to put this in at the crown area of forty-seven square feet or seventy square feet, and she'd say he or she would say sure. So I'd, I'd, be, I'd be very happy for our list to say your other trees are quite possible, you know, they're not invasive trees, so they're quite the, possible. The tree ordinance says that replacement trees have to replace the canopy of the tree that's removed within a 30 year period. And, it, and then it says, and they need to be drawn from this list. And I think the list is too constrained. And with the, but the, it can provide recommendations, and then the homeowner, if they want to choose something that's not on that list, the, the onus is on them to come up with the data on how big that tree is likely to be at their years. It's uh, not that hard. No. Yeah. So if anybody really wants to plant a tree that's not on that list, uh, they should be able to find the information about it. Yeah. Was that the but end of your what, presentation? Sorry. Did you have more slides to go through? Was that the end? Okay. That's I just wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> Dick, you, you, the tree you planted up, we planted up in Horizon View. That sounds like Pyrex Stephanica. Yeah, is it on the list? I don't know. <laughs> Let's see, it would be probably in the mid height category. I think there may be a list of trees that provide diversity that you want to continue you encouraging to people to plant. Well, uh, you know. My garden is full of all sorts of trees that are not on the list, right? yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I like to plant for a variety of different things. And are you pretty sure that all those other trees you planted, Richard, are are not going to become invasive trees in the future? I'm pretty sure that you know. For example, no, I have three species of Novafagus. I'm sure they're, people, they're, you know, brought in holly and said these would be great around yeah. Christmas time. Yeah. And, and well, so they're certain characteristics. If you look at ivy, holly, laurel, cherry, and Rubus, let's say some of the big weeds, they're all bird dispersed. And so that's one. Uh, yeah, how it, how it, how it, how it spreads. Yeah. Uh, well, it'll be in Mount Nash. So, it's, you know. You, we, we, you'll find opposition, of course, in the community. You know, <laughs> people feel very strongly about native trees. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, it, it will be pushed back on that. And I think 
you know, the case is that we we sure we understand, I guess, the the relative benefits of the native forest versus versus a diverse forest that has certain aesthetic considerations and trees to please us. Uh, I mean, it's kind of the difference between creating an arboretum and a native forest. Well, diversity also fosters resilience to yeah. uh, climate change and pests. And well, that's that's what that is like that. Another factor, but, yeah. Yeah. And, and it makes for a greater, better habitat for uh, wildlife. Uh, this John Marshall here is a professor of forest uh, resources that studies bird diversity in, the, in our area. It has shown very nicely that you get much greater bird diversity in, uh, say, suburban habitats where there's a lot of diversity of plants and gardens because there's so much more habitat, food sources, things like that, than you find in similar habitats that are just native plants. So, uh, know and understand. Well, we the, the old saw that I've been raised with is that, that the, the, the creatures that inhabit those trees have evolved over time with the trees sure. and, uh, and uh, there's a coexistence that's evolved in terms of uh, the, you know, insects and mammals and yeah. and everything that lives in the forest. So I you know I don't know I'm certainly uh, that's true but you know our, our native Lowland Kazutsan forests are remarkably undiverse in terms of mm -hmm. plant species and animal species. Um, and it's because we have stable environments with uh, moderate mesic habitats that in those ecosystems uh, tend to have small number of species that dominate. You go east of the Cascades, where you get much more habitat heterogeneity, you have many more species of animals and plants um, than you have on this side of the country. Well, a little bit changes suddenly a little bit, but on the, on the same topic, it seems does seem kind of arbitrary to me that we sitting around the table with, like like Tim did apparently uh, looked at uh, trees that he thought were that were would be great to have on the list. Uh, it's, it's kind of an arbitrary very quality to that. I mean, make the case that we. We paid attention to trees, and that's why we're on the tree board. And several of us have made career of trees, so mm -hmm. um, maybe we're in a unique position to to do that. But, uh, well, I think part of there are alternatives to that. Right? I mean, I don't think there's. I'm a big fan of native. I mean, my garden has has a matrix of native plants. It's sort of like the arboretum, which has a matrix of native species in which a collection of non-native species mm -hmm. uh, thrive. Mm -hmm. um, and the tree list is not all natives. In fact, there's one page of natives, I think, back or something, that, but most of it is not natives. Aren't the, aren't the natives highlighted, though? Oh, maybe they are highlighted. That's how they are. They're, they're asterisks. They have asterisks yeah. and they are in bold. Yeah. yeah. So and it's, the code recommends preference for natives. Yes. But, uh, yeah. and, the, and conifers to replace conifers, if they are ever being certain. Something like that. And so it's. Uh, you know, one of the concerns that had been expressed was that people are going to remove Douglas firs and plant Japanese maple, right? Which only grow 25 or 30 feet tall instead of 200 feet tall. And, and over time, that could dramatically change the canopy structure. But I, I'm an advocate for expanding the diversity in a tiered canopy, and that means having trees in that mid range. You know, one of the reasons why. We have two species of evergreen small trees that have become such problems, holly and laurel cherry, is because our native forests don't have that intermediate canopy plants for whatever reason. It never evolved here. Yet these species that have come in from Europe thrive in that habitat. So it's not that things can't grow there. And when they do come in and start to thrive, they drive out what our native. Uh, vegetation, which is low growing, like salal and closing grape and sword fern, which only grows, you know, three or four feet tall. So, we can invasive. So, I'll be pretty invasive too. <laughs> I will say, as someone who spent a, quite a while reading this list while trying to figure out what we needed to do, um, what process we need to follow, I ran into, like you said, there's a lot of things that, like, to Varieties of it are on there 
but there's dozens of others. So trying to figure out like the tree that we actually have taken out wasn't on there <laughs> specifically, but was, I was guessing as someone who doesn't know a lot about tree species <laughs> that it would probably be fine because it was a, a legacy tree already and was similar to one that I did find. Um, would have been very helpful to have something like I think you mentioned earlier that maybe it was you know, um having an explicit process for like this is our recommended list. If you would like something else that's not on this list, here's the process, here's the information you need to submit, here's who you submitted to and how you submit it, and then guidance for the arborist on how to approve or deny that those types of requests and having some more explicit like don't even bother looking at these things, yeah, yeah. both in terms of a list of species and then some guiding, like, by the way, this is how we're going to, if you get denied, it may be because it's one of these, ticks one of these boxes that we're specifically looking to not include. Um, but like those would have been really helpful things as a homeowner trying to navigate the process without knowing a lot about it. One thing I intend to mention, I, I would really like to, Postpone doing anything on this until we have an arborist. <laughs> because I think I think before we certainly before we add trees, even before we take them off, especially before we add trees, we ought to get his or her input on it. I mean, that's it's a, a tree professional. But, um, I mean, who will that's be, sort of why this who, who will be working will be with people. Who yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I think well, we, I, we definitely should take off. I mean, we can wait until arborists we can take off anything that's on that. Yeah, 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 yeah not just for your concern. Absolutely, your concern was. We can do that. It turns to be kind of hard, but unless somebody can is better at formatting than I am. I tried to sort of recreate the list with all those trees, and I it, it would just be quite difficult. You is it in an Excel? I just I have it's a in a PDF, oh, yes. and I, I converted the PDF to a Word file. I don't know how who actually put this list together, but I my suspicion is it was put together by looking and reporting at some local nurseries, and oh, they have this and this and this variety of maple or flowering crab apple or whatever and so they ended up on the list rather than you know having it be anything that might be comprehensive or you know we can you know if somebody can easily just take out the things that are uh they're on the noxious weed list so it's like about a dozen species that's fine there's also tim also found a couple of uh taxonomic issues so there's probably you know, we have an advanced version of pdf or acrobat you should be able to redact the the names of the trees that you don't want on there. It's it's yeah, but it's also getting the line. It's a table, so there's all these lines in there. You gotta get the lines out too. Mm, and there's yeah. PDF built into the table. Yeah, I, I could have yeah. done that. Yeah. Not, there's probably some way to convert it to a Maybe, table yeah. that you can access. Yeah, yeah, yeah Excel would be done. I'll try it. There is a and one of them Tim the big deal being interested. There is a Kemi Super species on there that now has three separate names. Uh -huh. Lost, lost, Port Orford cedar, cedar could be cupressus, can be cypress, or uh, calotropus. No, that's not calotropus, is only the Alaska yellow cedar. Alaska yellow, okay, Alaska yellow cedar that has three separate names. Yes, cupressus, can be cypress. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how much we need to mess with offering a table ourselves. I mean, I, I, I it's a council is going to make a decision about that. It won't be our decision. It's ultimately going to be a recommendation. I don't think, I don't think it's a council issue necessarily. I'm not sure, but I don't think they would have to approve it. But I think they are looking for a recommendation or advice from us. I can see this going two different ways. One, and that's kind of how I've heard the conversation so far, is a fairly descriptive list. These species should be added, these species should be removed. A second approach would be more delegating to staff to say these are the principles. If it's on the King County noxious list, it's out. If it's native, it's in. If it's becoming native, it's you know coming up with some core principles and then delegating it to staff to then implement it and say, okay, up to the city arborist, the city wants these types of trees on the list. Are there trees that weren't native 30 years ago that are, are becoming native now? Let's add it to the list. So really the question becomes, how descriptive do you want to be as a tree board? Do you want to focus more on identifying specific species or more on identifying general principles? So when I approached Phil about um, 
making the list recommended and letting homeowners add, suggest an alternative to something that's on the list. His reply was that he wanted to have a mandatory list because it would simplify the process for the arborists who would not have to make any decisions other than look at the list. And he said he thought that the city's lawyers preferred that. Um, so, well, I think I think there will always be that element of negotiation in there. I think giving the I mean arborists hard and fast stuff like like King County Notch's weed list, you know, I think it's pretty safe ground to work with. Um, but my my point was just Larry that maybe. That it, it might be, I guess, two things. Rather than try to modify that table ourselves, if we could write what we think the changes need to be, and and in that form make the recommendation to the to, to the council whatever the next step is, and uh, it's a staff function to see that the to, to that stuff gets updated to, to uh, reflect that. You know, and I think it is true that around, the, around this table there is probably expertise that could that could spell that stuff out. I mean, without re redoing the chart itself, the table could say, "Here are the changes that need to be made," ra rather than say, uh, "You know, this kind of a tree should be removed from the from the list," and, and ask the ask the staff people to to you know wade through that and come up with the. So you guys are going to believe that the city council has to approve any changes to the list. Well, is this part of the code? Oh, no. So the code says the general tree list is a list of tree species maintained by the city and approved by the city's qualified arborist. So nowhere in the code is there is the tree list. So the tree list is done by staff. Now, also, there's the list of diameters for what that's more within species saying, this is what makes an exceptional Douglas fir. That's a, that's a total separate issue. But in terms of these trees are allowed, um, as far as I can tell, the council doesn't have a direct role in that. So that would be maybe between us and the arborist to come up with a list that uh, uh, would meet the requirements. Okay. Uh, but I think that where the code does enter in is it says, Replacement trees must be drawn to this list. That's something that I, yeah. okay. I can guarantee you. That I, well, I believe strongly that there are members of the council who would like to, to know that. I'm sure Larry would see that as part of his function to sure if something like that were coming down the pipe that they that they were aware of changes like that. Take it just to the list or about. Well, yeah, we the, the, these particular species have been removed from the list. Uh, for example. Uh, Almost a courtesy, but yeah, yeah you're talking to members of the public about that. Oh, that's a courtesy, yes, and information benefits. Yeah, yeah. The changing has to be read, it has to be no, read, it has to be revised. I don't think, I don't, well, Larry said, I don't think we need to do that, but I thought no, that's it. I'm not sure I've received it. I'm sure Larry reports to the council. Yeah, yeah. things are going on the So, so where do we go from here with this? Do you think we, uh, it's going to be a work plan item? Yeah, just pursue it in that way. Yeah, I think probably there's yeah. the thoughts that we've been sharing tonight. Um, one item that I thought that came to mind when I read the article that I sent the link around, or Matt sent the link around about assisted migration that was in um, mm -hmm. the Seattle Times. I, I don't know how many of you had a chance to read that, but I thought it was really well done because it was fairly even handed in terms of talking about the different approaches to assisted migration and whether you know, there's debate about whether it's appropriate, uh, whether species migration or population migration, which they've talked about being different things. Species migration would be planting redwoods, which only occur in California and Washington. Uh, population migration would be finding genetic stock of Douglas fir from further south in its distribution and planting it further north, but within the same distribution, distributional limits of the species. Um, those are all valid concerns. And I know that there's, that pertains to this list if we want to try to uh, 
either in some way identify species that might be or resilient to climate change or something like that it might be a lot of work to try to do, but it might be something that homeowners would like to see. Or that could be a separate issue. Well, that's not actually it's the list actually includes a check mark for drop resistance. Yeah, right. And that's mm -hmm. that's probably the most important thing. Yeah. And I want a couple of ones that uh they want to take off or things like citrus spruce and he said, you know, are really borderline anyway, and they're not going to get any less borderline at this point. Yeah. Uh, like there's a few others that he said, you know, we're really poorly adapted to this climate, and generally those are only going to get less well adapted. So we do have that one column that does sort of say this is probably a little more resistant to climate change in many sites. So we're, we're part way there. Yeah. They, uh, the, my one hesitation about that article was the fact that they, in the illustrations and in the text, they both they cite giants and boyas of redwoods as examples of, and you know, we should, in my opinion, we should not be encouraging anybody in Lake Forest Park to find either of those trees because they're just too big for residential uh, landscape. But, <laughs> and, the ones and I see Richard seem to be doing well, actually. The they do well, they do well, yeah. but a hundred years from now, they're gonna overtake neighboring homes and whatever else, and they're not going to be, they're going to say, what am I doing here? Right, you know, they just get too big. Well, I, hear, I, I understand your excitement. I'm not sure I would agree that that would be a disqualification. That's well, you know, we had a, a, a case just a couple of years ago of a tree removal somewhere up on the south side of the city in a residential neighborhood of a giant sequoia, and the neighbors were really upset, but it was breaking up the sidewalk, it was damaging, risk of damaging the foundation of a house that it was going next to. It was a small lot and had a tree that was way over since. And then one that was also a problem up near the Sheridan Market on that slope below, you know, 522 this year, it was such a hoo ha, -ha about a, a lot where it was gonna be developed and they wanted to remove some trees. The problem there, in my estimation, visiting the site was the reason that the homeowner developer was building the, their house back in the lot was because a neighbor had a giant sequoia on their property that was way too big for the property. And they weren't going to take that down. So the, these other trees had to come down. My solution would have been to take the giant sequoia out. But, you know, that's not a problem. <laughs> One of the things about the whole system migration thing is that you look at that list of recommended trees, with a very small exception number of exceptions, anytime you plant any of them, it's assisted migration. Yeah. Um, assisted migration, I mean, it's, it's it's a forest natural ecosystem. It's not a yard thing. Yeah. Everything you plant in a yard, with very rare exceptions, is assisted migration. Yeah. Um, and, and when they talk and about- we, And we already have sequoias all over the place. Yeah. A few redwoods too. Yeah, I think that the, the discussion about establishing sequoia, the giant redwood, not the, the Giant Sequoia, the Sierra, is to try to establish groves that could be in the long term successful. So they would be out on the and that's long places like that. They wouldn't be here. The planning occasional one here and there is not going to save the species. Okay, anything else about this? I think that this should be uh, a work plan item and the we should come up with recommendations for the city and see that it's not going to be as you see it's not going to be. <laughs> well, it seems like that work that uh, Doug did that yeah. sharing with us. In this case, I would flash my answer card to that. Can you send that your list of recommendations around, Doug? Yeah, that'd be good. Sure. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll send Tim list, actually. It'll be simpler. Okay. Tim hmm. list, it's a very nice order that he has, but the same order as the uh, if they are on the pre codes, you just go on the pre code one by one and take this one, take this one out. Well, then page two, they use that you showed. Yeah, yeah. That's that's summary. Yes, that's 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 Here's a fun fact assuming the data is trustworthy. Well, Wikipedia says there's roughly 80,000 giant sequoia in the world left. And the tree inventory says there's 1,011 of giant sequoia in Lake Forest Park. <laughs> So apparently Lake Forest, uh, if the data is accurate, Lake Forest Park has about one and a quarter percent of the world's giant sequoia. <laughs> I doubt that we have anywhere near that many in Lake Forest Park. 
in the inventory. Uh, now that's appendix five. Yeah. That's for small sample sizes, you know, bias the estimates when you multiply it out. So when you walk around and you pay attention to them, it's quite a few. Yeah, there's our neighbors have two in their yard. Greg, because they're outgrowing everything around them. That they're they're red, they're easy to identify in one way because of their what the leaf kind of shape is also not possible to spruce. But this is you remember when we were looking at the report, you and I are both concerned about the fact that red red alder had gone from twelve percent to two percent. And I looked through raw data, I guess two percent. Yeah. They just didn't have this time around they didn't have to be with a lot of red alder. So yeah, yeah. that's a relatively common species compared to the giant sequoia. The the error on any species is not very common. Huge. Yeah. And if you know and particularly if it's something that people like to plant that you know, somebody says, Oh, I'm gonna plant six. European bird cherries in my yard. All of a sudden, we have forty thousand European <laughs> bird cherries in Lake Forest. If that, if that got hit, if that got hit by the plot, right? So it's it's that survey is useful for some things, but it's just because it's, it's because the city is so variable, it's just it's just it's a statistician nightmare to try to look at the vegetation of the city. Yeah, unless they have a lot more plots. Yeah, or a lot more uniformity in the lands. Well, uniformity, right? But, and, think, and that's why the, that's why they oversampled sampled more of the small plots because yards, which are you know non-forested yards, are just all different. Imagine if they sampled six, right? All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, much more interesting. Um, <laughs> I mean, you think your yard is basically forested? Yeah. So half of our we have an acre. Half of it is just second growth forest. It's mostly Douglas fir, big leaf maple, alder. Yeah. Uh, Western Red and, there, and there's a lot of lots like that, and they're all going to be pretty similar. But the yards like mine, where somebody said, Oh, I think I'll plant it. Somebody 20 years ago said, I want to plant a Katsura here. And somebody five years ago said, I'm going to plant a Japanese maple here. And somebody two years ago said, I'm going to put a you know, a red maple or a pine maple in the backyard. And then my neighbor, whatever she took out a tree, didn't replace it. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge variation, lot to lot. We just, I, all that rare stuff is just. Yeah, it just it just needs to be considered intelligently. Yeah. Or res intelligently. Okay. If we can uh set that aside, I want to spend uh, a little bit of time now at least orienting us to the work plan and the revisions that we'll need to do. So for Victoria and Stacy, this is new. Um I think that's one of the things that we're mandated by the city to do is have an annual work plan. And it um, guides us in what our priorities are as we think about it over the next couple of board meetings and um, gives the city some idea about what our priorities are. Um, what I've found in the years I've been on the board is that you know it's a lot of good intentions and some of them get carried through. <laughs> and it's a lot of it is depends on you know who has the interest to work on something. Right? And make it happen. Okay. What are the uh, highlighted items? I wasn't sure of that. Um, you know, I think those were things that uh, we had. That we may have had those highlighted because they were priorities that we decided on last year, but I, now I don't actually remember. But at the top of the work board plan, it there are actually four stated things. And uh, one is public outreach and education. Second is tree planning and maintenance. Third is advised council on citywide tree studies uh, and priorities. And the fourth is be aware of opportunities and threats to advise council there. Um, when we did this last year, we combined three and four. And that's why you only see three categories in the actual work plan. Um, because by combining those, the three points then become the three um, stated uh, you know, reasons for the tree board to exist, right? There are three things in the, the document that, uh, the founding document for the tree board, if you will. And that's one is the origin story. Yeah, or outreach and education, planning and maintenance, and then advising the council of the city. And so uh, those are the sort of, that's how we organize this. Um, and so the first heading under here was public education and outreach. And so let's just go down through what we had for this year 
or last year now, and see, uh, you know, we can do maybe a rough first pass about which things we want to carry over. Are there any things that we think we should uh, drop out? And then as we work on this, we can see if there's new things we need to add. Okay, review the web content and incorporate code changes. That, so like I said, this has been carrying over for years now. Um, and can we add your name? Yeah, so that's, uh, if, you know, Marty is obviously, uh, let's not worry about names today. Let's just go over and see what there is. And, and I'll ask each of you to think about this before next year and see if there's areas that you particularly want to engage in. Uh, develop content to improve public outreach. So this is something we talked about earlier. Uh, and Stacey, Picard, you guys might, this is an area where you might want to be engaged. Uh, host the annual Arbor Day activities. Um, so Lake Forest Park is a, what's the status of Tree City or something like that? Mm -hmm. And one of the, the criteria for maintaining that status is that we have to do an Arbor Day event. Uh, last year, we did a tree planting up on uh, Horizon View Park. Uh, there have been a variety of different things that normally involve tree planting and some sort of public outreach on it. Very. Uh, I just wanted to add something. Um, Josh Parker, that's Mandy's uh, widower, oh. um, is very interested in maybe having that dedicated to Mandy. And he also expressed interest in, at his own expense, pairing a tree planting with a bench. Mm -hmm. And so uh, well, that could be something the tree board looks at for the April Arbor Day planting. If they would ever um, I think that makes it especially important to do one this year because I know. I think I he talked to me about it too or something. I don't know if you got the same email. I think he wanted he wanted to sprinkle some of the reactions over the trees we planted or something, or maybe fertilize the tree with the reactions or something like that. <laughs> Compost the tree. Or something. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, he, you're he, right. he wanted to do that. And I think that's of course that means we'll need a permit. That is right. And that's the sort of thing that I think we would have to get parks engaged with, right? Because I don't know. Oh I, I yeah, I, I'd like to pick benches are this. benches are a real a bench is a thing. That's right. That was the guy. I, I started asking around about uh, what it takes to plant a tree on city property, and uh, uh, it seemed to be the public works was one. I think I talked to you, Matt, about it tonight, or uh, oh, you know, maybe it was maybe it was Jeff. Maybe it was Jeff. <laughs> what it, Jeff? Anyway, there, there doesn't seem to be any policy or guidelines. I'm sure there are. I just haven't found it yet. For how you go about planting a tree, like uh, you planted a tree, we planted a tree at Horizon View a year ago. It took a, a year, I really, to find a location that the city would agree on. We had picked a couple of other locations. They said, "Oh no, we're thinking about expanding the parking lot, or uh, right, right. too close to the street, or it's one thing or another." And so, yeah, there's a that's an issue. Um, one thing, there's a, I have a couple things in mind. We don't need to get into okay. Arbor Day planning yet today, but there were some trees that Tim Hahn and arranged to plant up on the south side of the uh, reservoir. Yeah. Three trees at each corner yeah. of those trees. And the three parodias that are on the southwest corner are doing great, but only one of the three trees that they planted on the southeast corner survived. Yeah. And so uh, that might be a place where we could re- store that and say a different tree would be better there. Hard to know. It might be nice to try to get two more of the same one that's there. If one of them got hit by a, a vehicle or something and knocked over and killed the slide. It doesn't matter what yeah. the tree's on the ground. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I don't know what tree was really adapted to the site. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um Okay, that's and there's other things. Another option for Arbor Day that I had in mind was picking an area in a park I have in mind through Five Acre Woods because I see it frequently where there's a heavy concentration of invasive species and do a restoration where we remove the invasive species and plant natives or something like that. Like the uh, Arbor Day event that we could do that could engage the community in some way. And, well, you know that the stewardship foundation. You know, so I was going to yeah. raise my hand and say, but, yeah. uh, "Sorry to chime in, but we would be highly yeah. interested to help." Uh, what I particularly have in mind is that area on the south, it's the east side, where there's a big uh, black locust infestation. Yeah. 
So Polly Saunders has been kind of taking the lead, but I'd be happy to help uh, make the connection. And, and we would we probably have funds to help, you know, with that as well. But I think removing those trees would require professional. Um, That's, I mean, I'll, is it appropriate to chime in yes, for a second? Because <laughs> when you were talking about planting trees, I mean, we plant trees all the time at Grace Cold Park uh, and Five Acre Woods. And we do coordinate with Scott Walker and um, Corey. And it's been fairly easy, low, I won't say low stress because we make a plan to water, et cetera. But I would think at Five Acre Woods, we could do a similar. Some of the Arbor Day plantings we've done have been sort of in public spaces and tried to have a little bit of educational stuff around it. Like the one at, on Horizon View last spring, there were maybe 10 people there and they were mostly three board members and city council members. And then there were a couple of people who were walking by. It's like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> Even though we advertised it, we put up posters and on the website. So I could serve, we're going to have a board meeting another other annual meeting. But I could bring it. We would be interested. I'm sure people in the Silverton Foundation are interested to work on the Arbor Day activity. And with, it's with something the, like a restoration. Yeah. We have a fairly short timeline because Arbor Day is in April. Um, but we're out there doing restoration. Five Acre Woods every first Saturday of the month is the standards doing an Arbor Day. Okay. I'm thinking if, if we want to do something like removal of uh, big trees big where we have to pay somebody to an arbor, commercial arbors to come in, take some things down, would require some advance money. Okay, well, that the Arbor Day is something that falls to us. It's a city requirement for the three city thing, and um, usually in the tree board takes responsibility for that. Um, communication and peer advocacy with stakeholder groups, Lake Forest Park. John has been really great in coming to our board meetings. Um, and I think there's more we can do with them. Um, tree walks, this has been sort of a personal project. Uh, I've been doing it with David Hepp, who did the original tree walks. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the tree walks at Lake Forest Park. Uh, David Hepp, who is on the tree, uh, Lake Forest Park um, Stewardship Foundation, put together a nice little pamphlet uh, full of four walks in different neighborhoods in Lake Forest Park. Where you could walk around and take a couple hours and he points out trees in people's yards or in parks and things like that. It's really kind of neat. It was a little black and white pamphlet. And so I started a few years ago going through them and going out and taking photos of trees and creating from his pamphlet, he gave me the, the word document, um, uh, photo and illustrated walks that I created in PDF and are on the city website so you can, you know, load them on your. Uh, phone or something and as you walk around you can see the tree that is being described because otherwise it, when you just have a text saying such and such is in this yard uh it has you know, you know it's a, and the rough description is kind of hard to tell necessarily where it is so i've done two of them so far and i've got some pictures uh in place for the third one i'm hoping to get it ready by spring and then there's one more there were four in the original but it might actually be fun to do more of them um, and I've thought about expanding this somehow to do something in conjunction with the park service or the, the parks department of having some label trees and parks with little uh, uh, or the QR codes where yeah. people can read about the tree uh, from a little tag that's on a stake in the park. So as more things that we can do education wise around trees, I think, uh, in that regard. There's some there's some student that's short dressed who would love that as a yeah. senior project. Yeah. I mean, I think when you know the under at a concert. No, I don't know, but I know there's the kids over there that spend all kinds of amazing things. Do you ever coordinate with the garden hawks? Are they only put on once a year? They do that once a year. We've never done anything with them. Yeah. I was actually asked to have my garden in there then one time and I said, oh sure that'll be fun. So I used to the the native plant side used to have garden tours and I would have them come to my garden. But when I started talking to the person about planning it and they said okay we expect 200 to 400 people 
is there a place where we can have a string quartet that will play some music and have a stand for some refreshments? And I, I, I just said, wait, wait, wait. This is not what, that's not what I have in mind. So uh, I backed out of that. And where and we got to have room for you know to park. You know how many cars they said. You know, I'm on a fairly busy street, so I, uh, it never happened. But no, we have never done anything in conjunction with them. Well, I would. Um, I only envision offering your pamphlet or something. You're just like use it, using it as an education moment. Yeah. If you enjoyed this garden walk, you take your own tree walk. Yeah. And just pair it. Well, that, that's yeah. yeah, that's the sort of thing that we could probably put. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I do work with that group every year. I do the signage around the city and sort of keep it local. Yeah. But uh, that would be a nice to addition to that. If, if they were, if they have four or five sites that somebody could go through and identify the three or four most interesting trees on the site, because they, they're emphasizing gardens yeah. uh, and stuff. But but to know that uh, there's something about any trees that are on that lot as well, which might tend to get overlooked, would be kind of a cool idea. That would depend on the gardener who is hosting the tour in their property as to whether they're overlooked or not. Yes. yes. Well, uh, yeah, but to, to, right. I think those folks maybe are not oriented to that master gardeners who have cases and probably have something about trees, but there's a lot of things that are interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's a problem. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. So, I think the, that there are a variety of ways that we could do educational things around trees, the actual trees, as opposed to the tree code or yeah. the community forest, and that's a general thing. Do you think it's premature to start publicizing and pushing the two tree walks that are ready to go? Uh, you know, they're on the city website. I think we yeah. could. I've been thinking that I would write a one of those stories to go in the Lake Forest Park e news hmm. of oh. what to when I get the next one ready to go. And that would alert them to the others that are already available. Yeah. Um, I don't know how else to get the word out, but it might be something that if there's a news online instant they could put um, besides well, so our our newsletter we send it to about six hundred and fifty. Oh yes, that's going to be happy to yeah. republish your articles. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think I'm way behind the time because my answer is always the shoreline here. Yeah, it's a good one. Probably reaches fifteen hundred people. Absolutely. Anyway, that's maybe another part of that. Good thing. Okay. So the next thing on the top of the next page was uh, resurrect or otherwise engage the heritage tree program. This is something that Mandy was going to we worked into, and obviously that didn't happen. But there is something called the heritage tree program that nobody seems to know much about. But there were a bunch of trees that were designated heritage trees that separate from anything having to do with the tree code. Um, there was no specific requirement. Citizens could nominate a tree to become a heritage tree. And there, uh, somewhere I found on the, the city website, I think, a thing about the heritage tree. There's a, a downloadable PowerPoint uh, slide show that talks about it. Do you know anything about that? I did back yeah. on the Environmental Quality Commission was kind of trying to trying to develop that program 15 years ago. It's kind of like a black hole because there's no criteria and then what do you do with it was a, so it was a nice binder made up with photos that people yeah. had submitted in the description. Yeah, that's what that is. It's a binder and who has the binder and when can I come up and see it? And, and, and then I would have the resources to put that material onto the city's website. And wouldn't we really want to do that anyway? Because it's people's favorite tree in their yard that they, yeah. they nominate for that. It's, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. This was planted in honor of our grandmother who died, something yeah. like that. You know, that yeah. it's things like that that are tend to be in there. I not eager to pursue it myself. I, I'm but, not either. But, maybe it's but I thought that since it it's a program that exists, a lot of people I've had I shouldn't say a lot. I've had a few people ask me about it. They hear I'm on the tree board and they say, Oh yeah, what about the heritage tree? So, you know, it's not something that I really know anything about, and it's not really a city 
I don't even know where that album was. It is now in the Sumi knows and it can put it did put together. So some honestly it's the first one I've heard of it. So <laughs> that's one sort of the response I've gotten whenever I've asked about it. No one the archives. But I think that's something that Mandy was going to look up something about his history and we we're going to try to come up with whether we either want to reopen this and reestablish it or get yeah, a clear sleep to go. Because I think there is something you could still find on the city website about it. And an interesting variation might be to catalog the uh, what we call the exceptional treatments. Yeah. To actually identify. What, you know, totally. Yeah. And, when I think about heritage trees, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. I'm not thinking about people nominating art. Yeah. No. Now the, yeah. the exceptional trees are defined by yeah. code, right? Yeah. It's trees over a certain di diameter based on the species and so on. And it would be neat to try to get that. And we talked about a couple of years ago trying to have a uh, tree contest or a tree uh, champion trees list for the city yes. to get people to promote, you know, to identify the biggest trees of any given species in the city and try to put that together. We tried to have a little competition about it and school kids and so on. And we, it didn't go very well. Part of the problem there is that. There are definitions of what constitutes a champion tree, and it requires having a, a diameter, it requires having an estimate of the tree height and canopy width and all that, which is takes some doing to calculate. Um, it could be simplified to just diameter across height and see what the biggest trees are simply based on diameter, which is easy to do. But, just, just to put a number on it, Depending on what number we eventually ended up uh, recommending to the council, there would be between three and ten thousand exceptional trees in the city. <laughs> yeah, that so is perhaps a listing is. is it, it really is that high. Yeah. Well, three hundred thousand trees in the city, according and to the numbers we were throwing out were on the area of seventy-one percent of them. So there you go. On the area, <laughs> and that's right on the. Uh, you found that on the website. Yeah. So the, you can see there's a scattering of sort of yeah. Is there tree on 53rd Avenue or on <laughs> this tree here on that personal significance? Yeah. Least, this is what you're supposed to submit, I guess, when you send in your photo. If you want to submit something to this, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's it's there. People come up with this and they think about the tree board and they think of this. Yeah. And so it's an interesting thing. You know, it's a, it was, I'm sure, initially thought of as some way to engage the community about tree sex. It, it looks like there was some heritage tree committee. <laughs> and that was before there was even a tree board, I think. Okay. So I think it's probably still something we should. Yeah. Figure out whether we're going to revive it or put it to sleep. Um, so, general basic plant management, sir, you know, uh, public education. This is something that we all wanted to do more with invasive species and how to educate and manage for it. Uh, you know, the Stewardship Foundation does a lot with, in the parks with management. Um, but what we really need is to get more homeowners on board with understanding the invasives and doing something about it. You know, we decided to not pursue that uh, Ivy Out contest again after the year you were involved because there was no way to get a good measurement of, you know, who, you know, how do you declare a winner? Yeah. We only had four people who participated that year and we decided to call them all winners and gave them each a tree, you know, which was the prize <laughs> that we set up for. Uh, but doing, you know, there might be some way to set that up as an ongoing. Well, this is thing. where we, we had talked about the ID out demonstration. Yeah. And I, I'm assuming we still want to pursue that even without Marty. I think it would be good to do. I think that's a great idea because I feel like there's a lot of information online and you can go down these rabbit holes on how to remove the best way to remove ID. And it just depends on how long you want to be removing things. 
Yeah. <laughs> and then you have a bunch of people spraying poison everywhere, or some people try the cardboard way. Mm -hmm. So for me, the best way was pulling it out. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. 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 and making sure you pull it out of the room. Isn't there already a fair bit of information online about the film? I mean, if you look up there was, Google Live, yeah, I, I did yeah, the same thing. There is, exactly. So it, I'm there, not sure we need to create any more. I mean, no, no, but just showing people, right? Like literally physically showing people yeah. just the easiest the, way. The, the plan <laughs> that Marty had in mind for this was to have an actual demonstration, which we invite people to come to. Yeah. But then also film it mm -hmm. and have a little video that we would put on the accessible on the city website where yeah. people if they looked up and you know, people will make a side like horse park they could get a little demonstration on how best to do it, what tools you need, what you know to expect. And yeah. Especially getting it off trees, which is the most critical part. Yeah, for us. For us it's all critical part. Yeah, I mean, if yeah. to prevent yeah. its yeah, right. okay. ultimate spread, because it doesn't go to fruit, right. it doesn't produce fruits unless it grows up on something. Yeah. Uh, it's bad if it's on the ground, but at least it's going to be stopped when it comes to a street. <laughs> I had talked with Marty a lot about that one, and I, I certainly want to be a part of pursuing that. Okay. And I, I think if it's the time, somebody like me should go ahead and get that application form for the permit that's needed, which at least really start taking a look at that. The permit is probably money or something like that. I don't, know. I don't think so. Okay, we had to get a permit for the, the thing at the Horizon View last year. It was pretty simple. 65. I just want to point out it's 855. So. Oh, no. Well, we'll just go through a couple more of these, and then we'll just call it quits when we have yep. the next one. Um, so that's the first part on public outreach and education. Tree planting and maintenance. Um, this is something that we talked about a lot in the last year because of the transit plan for uh, tree removal and the resources that are likely to come available for replacement, either by the, the transit people who are doing the transit project or in some way resources given to the city that we might have control over for doing it. And uh, so that is a continuing uh, discussion of how best to mitigate. I would just point out that the city did approve your recommendation. That's it's right. We made some recommendations for right. our uh, yeah. priorities. The council yeah. approved the map of priority yeah. areas. We did that. And yeah. most likely, Sound Transit would be contracting with the Conservation District right. to actually do the replanting, okay. and reaching out to potential owners and things like that. I, I would get rid of the first sentence there. It's, it's like we're just trying to be repetitive of one of the others. Yeah, okay, so we'll work on these in detail with the uh, future meeting. The McAleer Creek restoration. So this is pretty much done. This is Julia's big project. Although she spoke to me just the other day, she had walked down through there and she said, it's really gonna need a second pass to do weed removal uh, in there to help assure that the, all the plantings that have been put in survive. And her recommendation would be to hire the people who came in and did it the first time to come in and do a second pass, a quick pass through. That would require some funding, um, but that might be a project that we should consider since a lot of investment has already gone into uh, getting it to the stage that it's at so far. So advising the mayor and council on Citywide. Well, that's a, it, this might be a good place to stop um, since we it was 9:58. So this gives us some idea about uh, what to do in the future. Matt sent this around to everybody, so I'd encourage everybody before our next meeting to look this over and to have some ideas about where you feel your uh, energy best fits and your interests, and if you have any ideas for things that you think we need to pick up. That may not be obvious to us to be creative, I'd say. Okay. Larry, we used to have time for a report from the council. You've contributed a few things. Anything else you have to say as parting words? Uh, not really. Uh, we only met once in, in December, um, and a lot of that was just kind of cleaning up some items. Um, 
So yeah, I'll keep you informed. Um, but yeah, I think it's time to be really awaiting your recommendations about uh, accepting the treats. Okay. I won't be here next month, by the way. So. You won't be. Where are you off to? I don't know why. I have a quick announcement or report. Okay. Uh, it's just follow up on uh, we had uh, uh, Sarah Phillips, who some of you know, was kind of briefed us on the Miyawaki Forest project over in Shoreline. And uh, she wanted me to tell you all that it happened the planting early in December. They had 300 people show up. Wow. <laughs> on a cold, rainy day. There was snow falling for a few minutes in the afternoon. And nobody left. I mean, they had uh, they had great uh, some great chef. We had wonderful pumpkin bread, thousands of loaves, and you know, we had a good time. We had people, a lot of kids, a lot of students came with groups, and uh, they planted uh, twelve hundred plants. That planted. And this person who does this it has done this at different places, and those are organized groups to 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 to, to take on sections and still see them. That plants are planted in a diverse kind of way and not all flung. So, and there was a nice write up from uh, Linda Mapes, who's from the Seattle Times, oh. who writes on the environmental topic for that time. Nice write up. And she said that there was somebody there from the Department of Transportation that was interested in something like that on some of the small properties that they come around the area. So, just wanted to. I've been over, I walked through it afterwards, a week or so later. And it was very interesting. Uh, I'll be, I'm, I'm going to be very curious to see how it's about. I know it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's an urban invention. Yeah, it's an urban creation. It's a, it's a special kind of forest. And, and it's still a very of, experimental stage, I think, in terms of. I think it is. And it, they're doing them all over the world, and in different environments, I think they'll be very degrees of success. For, What's the intent? So the intent is in a small area to pack it with a lot of species. Do a lot of you invest a lot of time in advance in soil preparation. So you have really good soil. You plant a lot of a lot of things in a small area. It takes intensive the plan is that it'll be intensive management with watering and weeding and so on for the first couple of years. And then it's supposed to be self-sustaining. I think there'll be a lot of self-thinning. Things will, will a lot of things will never really die. Ask the but, guy what the mortality rate was, he said probably no more than 10%. It's his thought. And and, and how long? Over a three-year period. Yeah, that may be. Wow. I mean, if, that, if it's watered well and maintained. But there are certain things in there that are simply not going to survive as they grow up. There's a few some loving things I noticed that were planted that once everything gets crowded around, it will not make it. But it's, it's all native, so it's a, that's, it's a, it'll be an interesting experiment. So it's yeah, it's native to the bottom there. Native for this actual area or the state or for uh, Pacific Northwest at least. Yeah. So yeah, all of the things that I saw that I could identify. There were, you know, it had a lot of things like big leaf maple, Douglas fir, Sitka spruce, western red cedar, uh logical pine. So there's a lot of alder, a lot of our main prominent woody plants. I don't know how many of those twelve hundred were actually trees yeah. versus I think there might be plants. yeah. Maybe 30 or 40 conifers. Yeah. Seedlings. And then a lot of shrubs and stuff. Only a handful of uh, big leaf maples that I could see. An odd situation for a lot of full pine. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of full pine. Coast pine. Coast yeah. pine. Yeah. The coast, the oh. shore pine is a sort of a. Yeah, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty shady and tolerant. Right, that kind of product condition. Yeah, well, there are a number of things that are shade and tolerant in there that probably won't survive. So no, it's still not, but, yeah, and, or like Kinnikinnik, which is very sun uh, requiring. You know, once things grow up around it, it won't. Dr. Stanford, so we're again. Yeah. All righty. See you next week. Welcome, Victoria and Stacey. Next month, right? What's that? Next week or oh, next month. But I can't next week. <laughs> I didn't know you did the science for this. Nice to meet you guys.